from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lenny Bernstein. I'm a health and medicine reporter for the Washington Post, uh, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. And this is the 15th year that the Library of Congress has sponsored uh, this gathering. Um, if you were here at the last session, they told me I have to say both those things every time I introduce somebody, so that's why. Um, I grew up in a home with a father uh, who was a doctor, uh, still is a doctor, now retired, and taught me two um, very important lessons. One is that uh, some of the most important heroic and noble acts that we uh, may ever witness are performed by physicians. And the second is that I would never, ever want to be one. Uh, nothing that I read in Dr. Terence Holt's latest book, Internal Medicine, about uh, becoming a resident changed my mind about either one of those things. The people in this book are dedicated, compassionate, learned, and skillful, and they face tremendous frustration and sadness over what they see and the limits of what they, what they can do for us when we are ill. Dr. Holt is an internist who specializes in geriatric medicine. He teaches and practices at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. His previous book, In the Valley of the Kings, was a finalist for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Award for Distinguished Literary Achievement. Please welcome Dr. Terrence Holt. Um, thank you. I, um, I'm completely blind by these lights, so I could have to take it on faith that there are people out there making that noise. Um, I, uh, it, I'd like to take a brief, and it's actually functional, poll. How many of you have actually read the book? It's, it's not an ego question, it's a practical question. Good, okay. Then I'm gonna read some of it to you, okay? <laughs> this is, um, the book is uh, a series of independent narratives that do, however, track the progress of one resident from his first night on call to a few months after the end of the process. Um, and uh, that's about all I think you need to understand. This, this story is from pretty early in the process and it's called Giving Bad News. It's one of those icons of medical training, something you spend an afternoon discussing in the preclinical years and then gratefully forget, like community health or Medicare billing requirements. I don't remember anything we learned that day. All that stayed with me was a vague solemnity, a sense of having spent the afternoon in the middle of an Emily Dickinson poem, not one of the cheerful ones, and coming out of it about as wise for the experience. And so, as is inevitable with the lessons we tune out, it wasn't long before I learned this one the hard way. He was a 43-year-old with pneumonia. I was an intern on the Infectious Disease Service. He belonged there only slightly more than I did. He did have pneumonia, but pneumonias aren't really all that infectious, most of them. And on a service crowded with HIV, his presence was anomalous, more an accident of ER timing than a reasoned assignment from admissions. He had come up from the ER around two in the morning, admitted by the night float resident, and placed on my service. His story was unremarkable. He had developed a cough, then fevers and shaking chills that bought him a five-day course of azithromycin from his primary MD. When he'd failed that, the primary had tried him on levofloxacin, a reasonably big gun. When he'd failed that, the primary had sent him to the hospital, quote, for further avowal. It's part of the nature of the hospital where I trained, as it is with most teaching hospitals, that patients arrive without a great deal of documentation. In the typical community hospital, if you're unlucky enough to find yourself hospitalized, you at least have the consolation of knowing that your own doctor, who presumably knows your medical history, is going to be treating you. But admitting privileges at this facility are reserved for faculty of the medical school, who divide their time between laboratories, clinics, and the wards. When patients come here from what we generally call outside docs, they usually arrive without any more medical information than the patient can recall. If the patient is well educated, articulate, and interested in his health, that information can be complete, sometimes too complete. But usually the patient is none of the above. I wouldn't have had it any other way, but at times this complicated my attempts to understand what was going on, as with this time. The history and physical on the chart didn't say very much. The acute pneumonia, no other medical history, not unusual in a 40-something man, a high school education, and a smoking habit. Not employed, living with family, no meds. As for the patient's current state of health, that was somewhat more complex. 
In addition to the pneumonia, which had him coughing up bad phlegm these past two weeks, he had reported some difficulty swallowing and a weight loss he could only quantify by saying that he'd taken in three notches on his belt since last spring. The resident said immediately, that's not good. I looked at him. Weight loss, difficulty swallowing, resistant pneumonia, and a middle-aged male smoker, he said. Ah, I said, scanning the rest of the chart for a clue. The orders left by the night float resident included not the chest CT and bronchoscopy I'd expected, but an EGD, one of those gastrointestinal procedures where they stick a lighted tube down your throat and examine the inner lining of your stomach. Ah, I said again. The patient, an amiable, clueless fellow whose chief complaint when I met him after rounds was the absence of breakfast, looked better than his story sounded. Weight loss is a relative thing after all, and until you get into the absolute end of the range, it usually doesn't show. He was a skinny man who coughed once or twice with the weary, pained expression of a person who has coughed too much recently, and obligingly deposited the product in the plastic jar he'd been given for the purpose. The contents of the jar looked nasty, but then they always do. When am I going to eat, he said, when he had finished screwing the lid back on the jar. We explained about the EGD and how he needed an empty stomach for the test. OK, he said. And when's that going to be? We told him that it was hard to say. It's always hard to say. This is more than usually distressing because most of the people waiting for the call are waiting with empty stomachs. And despite the low quality of the hospital food, breakfast is by far the best of it. Even dinner starts to smell pretty good when your roommate is being served and you're still waiting for your call to GI. So we're used to explaining to people why they can't eat. It's the kind of bad news that takes a while to sink in. Mr. Jenkins spat disconsolately as if he had a bad taste in his mouth, and we excused ourselves, promising to let him know as soon as we heard anything, which, of course, we didn't because we got busy with new admissions and no one ever tells the house staff anything anyway. So when the number for GI procedures showed up on my pager, it took me a moment to remember Mr. Jenkins. But that was all right, because when I dialed it and heard the phone say, GI procedures, they put me on hold before I could give my name. Orville Shane picked up eventually. Orville, known universally as Awful, was a first-year GI fellow from Chicago who had earned his nickname by being the most abrasive personality in the entire hospital. He was not averse to lessening his betters now and then, and was entirely too eager to lecture the rest of us whenever possible. Who is this? he demanded. It's Harper, I said. You paged me. Harper. What are you going to do about your Mr. Jenkins? What? I replied, perhaps unwisely. Jenkins, your Mr. Jenkins, the one you sent down here with, he searched for a word sufficiently scathing, pneumonia. Look, Orville, I said, enunciating carefully. Is there a point to this? Because I've got an admission down in the ER, and, and you don't care about your Mr. Jenkins? Is that it? This was starting to get me mad. Do you want to tell me something, Orville? He snorted. I suppose I'll have to, since I doubt you could interpret the pictures, which are in Mr. Jenkins' chart, by the way. Tell me, he said, do you know what cancer is? What everyone wishes you'd get, I thought, but said nothing. As I suspected, Orville sneered. Well, it's what your Mr. Jenkins has growing in his esophagus, which is why he can't swallow, which is why he's losing weight, which is why he's got your pneumonia. And then the line went dead. Mr. Jenkins had esophageal cancer. It made sense. As Orville had so helpfully spelled out, it was the unifying explanation. But what a nasty explanation it was. As it happened, I did know something about cancer, enough to know that esophageal cancer is an especially bad thing. It's not all that common. Smoking and alcohol are usually risk factors. By the time it's diagnosed, it's almost always, as the oncologists say, out of the barn. Your odds of being alive five years after diagnosis are less than one in 20. Starvation, hurried along by metastatic disease in the lung, liver, and brain, is the usual mode of death. You can try to put a rigid liner in the esophagus to hold it open. You can try radiation, and for the optimistic, you can try chemotherapy. It was a dismal future Mr. Jenkins had in store. And it was up to me, I realized, as I turned from the phone, to tell him. It wasn't, really. It wasn't technically up to me. The service I was on had a number of doctors with more knowledge and experience than I had. There was the resident, of course, still in-house. There was the attending, now gone home for the night, but he could certainly break the news in the morning. 
a lot better than I would since he'd had the experience before. I hadn't had the experience, and I needed it. And to be strictly truthful, I wanted it. This was how we were supposed to learn. He was my patient, and I felt responsible for him. But also, I wanted to be the one to tell him. It's something I can't explain, didn't understand then, and perhaps would rather not understand about myself now. I hadn't had the experience, and I wanted to get it, so I squared my shoulders and marched down the hallway to Mr. Jenkins' room. He was the only occupant of a double on the west side of the tower. Here, on the sixth floor, the view out the window was a sweep down the hill to the town, garish under sodium vapor street lights. The yellow glow from the street was the only light in the room. Mr. Jenkins was in bed, asleep. He was snoring unevenly, a little puddle gleaming darkly on the pillow beside his open mouth. I stood at his bedside, listening to him breathe. Regular, unlabored, a little ratly, but basically the automatic tidal motion of a man in the middle of his life, the rhythm he had been maintaining from the moment of his birth. I stood there and listened to it, unconsciously holding my own breath for a long time until I realized what I was doing and drew a ragged breath out of the dark. Mr. Jenkins, I said softly. No answer. Mr. Jenkins, I said again. This time I reached down and pressed his shoulder lightly. He stirred, and abruptly he was wide awake, astounded, raised on his elbow, staring around the room. What? He said, or something to that effect. He was starting to pull back from me. In the darkened room, his eyes were enormous. Easy, Mr. Jenkins, I said, in what I doubted was a reassuring tone. You're in the hospital, remember? I'm Dr. Harper. We met this morning. Mr. Jenkins continued to stare at me as if I were a ghost, but he gradually subsided, muttering something I didn't catch beyond the tone of ebbing shock. Are you awake, Mr. Jenkins? He nodded, perhaps a more polite answer than the question deserved, and he lay there, still propped up on one elbow, waiting. I realized that I had no idea how to proceed. I tried to think of something, but all I could come up with was the tune to the Yellow Rose of Texas. It kept repeating itself unhelpfully, scattering my thoughts. Beyond that, all of the advice from that long ago, dreary afternoon with Emily Dickinson had evaporated. And Jenkins was waiting. As if aware of my uneasiness, he was starting a shy, reassuring smile. Mr. Jenkins, I began. He nodded at me encouragingly. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. For a horrible 10 or 12 seconds, the smile lingered on his face while the rest of his features abandoned it until it hung there in empty air. That test we did this afternoon? He nodded. It found a, a mass. This wasn't right, I realized. I should just name it. They found cancer, Mr. Jenkins. That's why you've been having trouble swallowing. That's why you've been losing weight. I stopped for a moment, unable to go on. In the silence that lay between us, I recalled dimly that I was supposed to do this, supposed to give the patient time to grasp the news. Reassured by this, I let the silence grow. Finally, his voice coming with effort, Mr. Jenkins said, what's it gonna do? Patients have this terrifying ability to ask the question, the one of all others you don't want laid at your feet. I could feel myself start to choke. The easy answer, the immediate one, was, I don't know. But I couldn't bring myself to say it. It would be too palpably a lie, because I did know. We both knew. But I couldn't say that either. I was wrestling with all of this, starting to hyperventilate, when I heard Mr. Jenkins sigh. That's a bad question, he said. The ghost of a smile shimmered in the dim light. He settled back against his pillow, ran the back of a thin hand across his forehead. Ain't nobody knows, do they? That's right, I said fervently. But Mr. Jenkins, I do know this. There are a lot of people in this hospital who can help you. The next thing that will happen is we'll present your case. And no, I thought that sounds legal. We'll, we'll present you. No. Um, We'll bring in a lot of specialists, that was it. Specialists had a reassuring ring, and we'll help you fight this thing. Unless, of course, fighting wasn't what he wanted. What if he didn't want to fight it? I was just about to start babbling, I realized. Would you like to see the chaplain, Mr. Jenkins? <laughs>
Mr. Jenkins lay back on his pillow with his left arm beside his head, fingers curled delicately as if waiting for something to fall into his palm. He closed his eyes. Maybe tomorrow, I said. I don't know if Mr. Jenkins slept that night. I didn't, of course, being a green intern on call, prone to jump bolt upright at the sound of my pager and feeling the need to go see every patient I heard about whether the situation warranted it or not. But if I'd been allowed to lie down for more than 15 minutes at a stretch, I doubt I would have fallen asleep without Mr. Jenkins' expression hovering in the dark above me. I had nothing constructed to think about, nothing really to do about him. The machinery of oncology would be unleashed on Mr. Jenkins tomorrow. There would be a routine series of studies to go through, and his pneumonia would undoubtedly respond to the IV antibiotics he was getting every six hours. There was nothing in particular to think about at all. So it was only his smile that might have haunted me, if I had been available for haunting. The next morning, I was up and moving around, having gotten perhaps 45 minutes of jumbled sleep and short-term memory disturbance, somewhere between five and the sounding of my alarm at six in the morning. Rounds began at 7.30, and I had nine patients to see before then, giving me about 10 minutes per patient, which even in my first week of internship was more than I needed to check the vitals, wake the patient, and do a quick exam. But I had set my alarm early with a thought to Mr. Jenkins, feeling that I would probably need more than 10 minutes to see him on this day. I left him for last, of course, walking into his room with fully 30 minutes to go before rounds. The sun had risen by then, the world below his window blazing with color, each red leaf on the far hills distinct in the clear air. Mr. Jenkins was asleep, his pillow blotched with pink, green, and brown, his mouth slack, the same regular rising and falling of his chest. Mr. Jenkins, I said gently. He roused more easily this morning, his eyes opening sleepily, but without the terror of the night before. They opened then opened wider, scanning the room quickly with an odd stock-taking motion, as if he were in the habit of cataloging every morning the contents of his room. He finished his survey with me, eyeing me with what I can only describe as a mild surmise. As he looked at me, uncertain, perhaps a little curious, I realized how deeply miserable I was to be standing before him. Not that I could think of any particular thing I'd done wrong, just that it was miserable to be there, having to enter into it again. How are you? I said gently. I'm not bad, he said. Been coughing up a bit, not so bad. Good, I said. I moved to the bedside, sank down in the chair, and took a breath. Mr. Jenkins regarded me, and his gaze, as I looked back at him, took another one of those curious sweeps around the room, returning to me. His expression was open, friendly, almost perky. So tell me, I began, have you been thinking? Jenkins looked puzzled. Thinking, he said noncommittally. I waited, but he had nothing more to add. Yes, I said, about... He elevated his eyebrows helpfully. About? You know. Oh, he said. The eyebrows settled, pressed down by a pair of deep furrows. I don't know, he added after a while. I understand, I said. It's a lot to take in. Yeah, he said. And then, a lot. Yeah, I agreed. We sat there for a little while longer, thinking about a lot together. What do you think, he said finally. Me, I squeaked. I was suddenly aware of the time. It's not really what I think, I began. Is it? If I was thinking he was going to help me out, I was wrong. Mr. Jenkins stared back at me across his bedclothes, his hands lying on top of the cotton blanket, as inert as old socks, the expression on his face an open blank. Open and blank. Not frightened, not worried, not remotely comprehending what had me so solemn and upset. Mr. Jenkins, I said finally. The eyebrows lifted a half degree. You do know what we're talking about, don't you? No change at all. For an instant, I hoped wildly that this was cultural. This was some strange thing that came from class or poverty that I wasn't getting, and I shouldn't mess with it, but it was too late for that. We're talking about your diagnosis, I said slowly. You remember, don't you? Now the eyes did begin to widen, the white showing between the irises and the upper lids. What I told you last night about the cancer? The face went stricken. I've got cancer, 
It was a hoarse whisper twisting upward at the end. It's in your throat, I said, pointing at mine. It's why you're having so much trouble swallowing. He blinked at that. I got cancer, he mumbled, looking inward for a moment, nodding again, then back at me. What's it going to do? I told this story on rounds. After the recitation of vital signs and exam findings, I added a brief anecdote describing his reaction to the news. The attending nodded and shook his head. You'll get used to this, he told me. We get so hardened to other people's bad news, it's hard to remember what a shock it is to them. Give him time to get used to it. They say that time assuages, and time was, for once, something we had to give. This was Friday. We had an entire weekend before the breakneck rhythm of the hospital would take hold of Mr. Jenkins and clutch him to itself. The pieces of aberrant flesh that were snipped from his mass in the GI procedure suite spent the weekend absorbing stains in the pathology lab. On Monday, Tuesday at the latest, we would have the definitive diagnosis. In the interim, there were some things we could get done despite the weekend, and we went ahead and did them, CT scans chiefly looking for possible metastases. The goal was to assess the spread of his disease, to stage him, and to assemble every other relevant bit of data in time for the multidisciplinary oncology conference that met in a cancer center every Wednesday. There, about two dozen representatives from medicine, surgery, pathology, radiology, pharmacology, and probably theology reviewed the dozen or so new cancer cases that had come up in the previous week with the goal of arriving at a consensus and a plan. But for now, Mr. Jenkins had time, a quiet weekend in a room with a view of fall descending over the Piedmont. Having been on call on a Thursday, I was facing my golden weekend, the once a month privilege accorded interns of two consecutive days off. I spent them with my family, 60 hours together. On my return early Monday morning to the upper floors of the hospital, I had a sensation of having been out of the action a very long time. Many of the patients I had been taking care of on Friday were gone, having been discharged by my resident over the weekend. Mr. Jenkins, naturally, was not one of those. I found him in his room, sleeping, a towel wrapped carefully around his head. One of the things I passionately hate about my job is that it requires me to disturb people's sleep, sick people who have managed against the odds to achieve some measure of oblivion. As I've grown older in the profession, I have become less conscientious. I often let patients sleep, but in those days, I was conscientious to a fault. I roused each patient so that he or she could bear witness to the events since I had seen them last. It was no different with Mr. Jenkins. I called his name from the doorway softly. Then as I moved to the bedside, called again, using the same tone I use when waking my children. I pressed briefly on his shoulder and called his name again. This time he stirred and peeled himself a peephole in the towel. What's that? Hi, Mr. Jenkins, I said softly. It's Dr. Harper. I paused to let that sink in. How was your weekend? The eye goggled around the room in the same odd stock-taking I'd seen the first morning before returning to settle on me. Okay, he said softly. Then the eye inspected again. It seemed to be looking for something. Did you get any visitors? No. The eye was still, some small creature sulking in its hole. I'm sorry, I said, and I meant it, too, thinking about him spending the weekend with nothing to think about but his dismal prognosis. If there's any time you want family around, it's when you're looking at something like that. I said as much to Mr. Jenkins. I can't remember the exact words I used. I don't suppose they mattered, because I found that eye of his staring at me and growing rounder until the towel came off his face, and he was lying there looking at me with horror everywhere in the bed around him. You say what? Then it was my turn to stare back at him, and maybe there was a little horror on my face, too. All I know was that for a long time we stared at each other as if each found the other completely incomprehensible. But it was up to me to break out of it first, and I did. You're cancer, I said. He tried to say something, but it strangled to a whisper. Do you mean you don't remember? He shook his head. Well, I stopped short at a loss for words. There are some things the brain just doesn't want to hold on to, I said finally. He was simply staring at me. Clearly, I wasn't connecting. Would you like me to tell you again? After a long pause, he nodded. I took a breath, and with a fugitive sense that this wasn't getting easier with repetition, I told him the story again. He seemed to take it in. He asked the same terrible questions. I had the same terrible lack of answers, and we left it at that.
I walked out of the room feeling shaken. It was partly the sheer rigor of it, having to tell again the story I'd never wanted to tell the first time. Or, okay, had wanted to tell, but only once. Was I being punished by some obscure hospital devil, forced for my sin of pride to experience again and again just what we do when we give bad news? I had a brief vision of myself as some kind of Kubler-Rossian version of the Flying Dutchman, doomed to wander the hospital forever in an unending struggle with denial. But that wasn't it, not really. Mr. Jenkins wasn't playing by the rules. Say what you want about denial, there was something else going on. I tried to convey this on rounds when we arrived at Mr. Jenkins' door. I made a hash of it, of course, trying to wedge in between the morning's lab results and the scheduled pulmonary function tests, some ghostly aperçu I couldn't articulate even to myself. The attention span of a team on rounds is short at the best of times. I could tell I'd lost the interest of the resident. The other intern, scheduled for clinic in the afternoon and desperate to be done rounding, looked at me with something that fell just short of hatred. The med student stood apart in some shared goofiness. Only the attending was still looking at me, his expression a tolerant mixture of amusement and minimal curiosity. What do you think it is, he asked me. I don't know, I confessed, feeling miserable that I was making an ass of myself, but Mr. Jenkins wasn't playing by the rules. What were the rules, I found myself wondering later. I had reached one of those random dead spells in the emitting day. I was at the workstation, going over sign-out sheets left by the three other interns whose patients I was covering overnight. CX if spike, Lasix 80 for SOB, call VAR if HCT down. I had several pages of helpful hints from my peers on how to manage their patients' likely misadventures. But there was no similar advice for how to deal with Mr. Jenkins. Give him the bad news until he finally believes it, because he has to. Make him do it until he gets it right. Isn't that right? Wasn't I doing it right? Naturally, the next morning, I saved Mr. Jenkins' room for last on my early rounds and knocked on the door with dread. I heard him hawk up something wet, spit, and then say, come in. At the sound of his voice, a little guarded, but otherwise sprightly, my heart sank. He was sitting up, looking around him as if puzzled by his surroundings. I stood in the doorway, a profound reluctance holding me. Hi, he said. I was suddenly aware that Mr. Jenkins was shy. Hi, I said back. I'm usually shy too, this morning more so. We held our positions for a long minute. Do I know you? He asked. The question hit me hard. The room took a sudden surge toward me, settling in a series of uneasy swells as I tried to absorb what he'd said. Not that I expect all my patients to know my name or even recognize me for the most part all those white coats. In most cases, the acquaintance is all too brief, too casual, but Mr. Jenkins and I had accumulated some history. I eased into the room, moving carefully as one might around a nervous beast, keeping my eyes on his as they followed my progress toward the bed. Don't you? I said as I crouched beside him. He stared at me with a slowly dawning recognition that as I watched grew into horror. You know me, don't you? I said quietly. What was this? Some kind of conversion disorder? A hysterical amnesia? You've seen me before, haven't you? Jenkins' head wobbled uncertainly between yes and no. I'm Dr. Harper, I said quietly, and you're here because... Jenkins suddenly whipped his bedsheet over his head, clutching it there like a Halloween ghost. The ghost shook its head emphatically and let out a low moan. Oh, God! It happened! It happened, didn't it? What happened? He threw off the sheet, and his gaze scattered around the room, taking in the surroundings one more time. I knew it, he sobbed. I knew it. This was progress, I thought, and felt immediately guilty as I realized how stricken he looked, staring around at the walls as though he expected them to fall on him. But I was making progress. Carefully, I prodded him. Knew what? He moaned. It's the crazy house. It's the crazy house, isn't it? He buried his face in the sheet again. Whatever I'd been planning to say up to that point vanished in an instant, leaving me flat-footed. Did I? The voice came muffled through the sheet. Do something? The face appeared, eyes reconnoitering nervously above the sheet as the voice dropped confidentially. It wasn't murder, was it? I didn't... No! I said, a little louder than I'd intended. You didn't... Oh, thank God, he said. Thank God. As long as I didn't... You don't know, he said soulfully. 
don't know what. There was a lot I didn't know, but Mr. Jenkins seemed to have something particular in mind. As for me, my head was swimming. Jenkins had recovered some of his usual equanimity. The look he was giving me now was downright cagey. Don't you know? He said. I shook my head. No, Mr. Jenkins, I don't know. What? What it's like. Waking up every day. I took a wild guess. With cancer? He turned on me. What? With cancer, I said, perhaps a little more brusquely than I'd intended. Waking up every day with cancer. Knowing about it, I mean. Waking up that way. Knowing. With cancer. The expression he gave me had nothing to do with my stumbling delivery. What? Cancer! Repressing panic, I might have been shouting, You've got cancer! A long silence, broken by the sound of his breathing. It was getting louder and louder. What kind of doctor are you? He was half out of bed, shaking a double handful of bedsheet in my face. I started to back away. What kind of doctor are you? He demanded again, coming in here and telling me something like that. Is that how you tell somebody that kind of thing? You're lying. You don't tell me that. You don't come in here and tell me that kind of shit. Get out. Get out of here. By that time, I was already out the door. I could hear his shouting all the way down the hall. How I got through rounds that morning, I'll never know. Maybe the rest of the team attributed my zombie-like demeanor to the rigors of a rough call night. I don't know. All I remember was that I watched as if from an indefinite distance as the knot of us worked our way around the floor, measuring with growing dread the approach to Jenkins' room and the moment when I was going to have to face him again. I was listening, too, for the sound of shouts from that direction, wondering if there was any way I could avoid going in that room again. Perhaps I could simply make a run for it before the moment when the patient reported that I had come in that morning and abused him. What kind of doctor was I? Helpless in the grip of forces I did not understand, there I stood again finally at the door of Jenkins' room, reciting by rote his vital signs that morning, exam findings, the results of yesterday's tests. I ground down. There was a pause. And, the attending said mildly, I might have jumped. Any progress? Progress? Impatience. You were going to work with him on his diagnosis. I thought he was having trouble with it. Any luck? I shook my head dumbly. The attending didn't wait, only nodded and swept open the door to Jenkins' room. I took a deep breath and followed. Jenkins was back in bed, looking peaceful enough. The television set was on. Katie Couric was interviewing a woman who looked just like Katie Couric. Mr. Jenkins was wrapped. We all stood for a moment looking at Mr. Jenkins. As the interview cut to a commercial, Jenkins' gaze turned slowly to us, widening to take in the small crowd wedging into his room. I recognized his expression, the same cagey inventory twice around his surroundings, the same poker face settling down. Hi, he said shyly. Good morning, Mr. Jenkins, the attending said. We all stood and looked at each other some more. Mr. Jenkins? Yeah? Would you mind if we asked you some questions? Uh-uh. The commercials were over. Mr. Jenkins' vision was starting to stray again. Can you tell us why you're here? A brief inner consultation. Sure. He leaned over and spat into the waste can. This. It's been going on for a while. And? Tastes nasty. He made a face. Anything else? Well, yeah, I got this sore throat. He laid a hand on his chest. It really doesn't feel good. I was wondering if maybe I got some kind of ulcer, you know, because my brother, he got ulcers bad. I was wondering if maybe they run in the family, because if they do, maybe that's what I got. You've got a brother, Mr. Jenkins? It was news to me. It was news to all of us. As we left the room, the attending muttered to me, call psych and call the brother. Easier said than done, of course. When asked for his brother's phone number, Mr. Jenkins agreeably recited a string of digits that connected me with a fax machine. When asked again, he wanted to know why I wanted to talk to his brother. It's about, it's about your ulcers, I said simply. I was tired. He gave me another string of numbers, which offered the mechanical advice that the number was not in service. On my third trip back, I got as far as Jenkins' door before I realized that the two numbers he'd given me were in different area codes. I spun on my heel, went back to the nursing station, and pulled his chart. Mr. Jenkins, I asked, where do you live? Lumberton. His chart gave an address in Fayetteville. How long have you lived there? The expression went cagey again. The eyes narrowed. Fifteen years, yeah, fifteen, right out of high school. 
I gave that some thought. This was a 43-year-old male with pneumonia. Somewhere along the way, Mr. Jenkins had misplaced a decade. Mr. Jenkins, I asked slowly, can you tell me what year this is? Sure. We looked at each other for a minute. What year is it? Oh, what year? Hmm, it's, I'm not good with numbers. It's a leap year, isn't it? It was, in fact, a leap year. <laughs> can you tell me who the president is? I don't follow politics. It's a dirty business. But sure, he looked cagey again. It's Bush. George Bush. I looked at him again, feeling beaten. He looked back at me. A brief standoff, then he coughed self-consciously. The cough turned into a real one, and when he'd recovered his breath, he looked at me again. What were we talking about? We did consult psych. They came by and gave the diagnosis of wernicke korsakoff dementia. He'd completely fried his short-term memory with too much alcohol. By that time, I'd managed to track down the brother who confirmed what I'd finally recognized, and a little bit more. It had been several years since Charles Jenkins had seen his brother, but he gave the essential outlines of the story. Mr. Jenkins had been in the Navy. He was, in fact, 43 years old, but between the age of 18 and 38, he hadn't been sober more than three days at a time. The brother said this with a weary resignation in which I tried but failed to hear a trace of bitterness. I wanted to hear the rest of the story, but Charles Jenkins cut it short. When can he come home? Two days later, Mr. Jenkins, his cancer thoroughly staged and determined beyond any hope of cure, sits peacefully in the recliner in his room. He's dressed in street clothes. Sunlight is streaming in over his shoulder. He's breathing comfortably, and this television set is tuned to one of the two hospital channels, which is showing a locally produced documentary about dialysis. When I go in to see him one last time, Mr. Jenkins is watching, rapt. I realize I'm almost looking forward to introducing myself again, if only to say goodbye. And for a moment, I watch him and find myself equally wrapped at the sight of him, sick, dying, and eternally unaware. For a moment, I am almost envious. The feeling passes, replaced by a kind of nostalgia. He'll forget me again as soon as I'm gone. I'll never learn from his account of me what kind of doctor I am. But that's not it. I'm tantalized by the sense that I've missed something here. I thought I was giving him bad news. The bad news wasn't his, it was mine. Out at the nursing station, I pick out of the general hubbub a nurse's voice speaking my name and the words over there and through the doorway see a man looking my way. The family resemblance is strong. I'm Charles Jenkins, the man says. He looks past me into the room. At my back, I hear a sudden cry. The reunion is a happy one. I leave them there, edging out of the room as I've edged out of so many, leaving the family to gather up the plastic bags of personal belongings, medications, paperwork with discharge instructions. My last memory of Thomas Jenkins is of him looking up from the chair. Sunlight surrounded him, his face alight in the recognition of one of the few faces in the world he can still remember. I like to think of him that way, that way and no other. I only wish I could hold myself so finally aloof from time. So um, I'd be happy to answer questions or um, hear comments or anything. I gather this room is not in immediate demand. It was that good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I'll. Stick around for a bit, but I really do appreciate your showing up. It's, uh, it's very good of you to be here and being such a good... Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Are they uh, uh, improving uh, patient-doctor communications in medical school? Oh, are they improving doctor-patient communications in the medical school? Um, they're trying hard. Um, you know, I came to medicine late in life. It's a second career, and I entered into that world pretty suspicious of it. Um, moved by kind of reformer's impulse. Um, and I've been very impressed, actually, by the earnestness with which uh, academic medicine especially tries, recognizes its own failings and tries to improve them. Uh, the attempts at doctor-patient communication are hamstrung by the insularity of the, that marks the whole academic world. We're all sitting in little disciplinary silos, and there's not a lot of knowledge about what communication is and how it might work. Um, they tend to draw on 
Well, social science is about as far afield as they'll get, and it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of clunky, but they, they're working on it. They really are. My own particular sense is that we really need more people with humanities background going to medical school because it's something that you kind of develop over a long period of time, a sense of who you're talking to and what they understand and how you understand yourself in that setting. And at my own institution, we are actually get, making a lot of headway there. We're seeing a much more diverse population of, of people entering medical school, which I think is a very good thing. But it's always going to be hard. There's two populations of people in the hospital. There's the patients for whom it's a dire crisis, and there's the people who work there for whom it's a job. And you're never going to change that. And that's always going to mean that there's going to be a lot of room for misunderstanding and misapprehension. And that's, so it's a constant work to try to overcome that. Yeah. Um, I may have missed something. Is uh, Dr. Harper a, um, a, a fictionalized uh, version of you, or? Yeah, th this has been an ongoing question. Um, it's hard to characterize this book generically. It's been sold as a memoir, and I'm happy enough with that because no memoir is 100% true. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to write nonfiction narratives about doing medicine. I think that's, even if you change details to hide the identity of the people involved, at least for the person writing the story and for the people it's about, somebody's suffering is being made a spectacle of, and I think that's just morally risky. Um, so these stories are collages. I didn't invent anything, I just put different pieces together so that there was no actual historical individual at the center of it. And Harper is a thin disguise for me, of course. Um, he makes slightly different mistakes than the ones I made. I don't think I ever woke anybody up in the middle of the night telling me I had cancer. Um, but, um, you know, I'm sure I did far worse things. But, um, it's a, you know, I didn't invent it. I, did, I tried very hard not to inject drama because you don't really need to. I tried not to, you know, there's two traps people fall into writing about medicine, people within medicine. One is, God, I'm great and, and, and holy and, and really, really good. And then there's the House of God and MASH uh, school, which tries to hold the whole thing up to contempt and ridicule. And I think they're both wrong. And you can understand why you might fall into either camp. It's really kind of hard to be dispassionate about this and try to be honest with yourself about what it's really like, but that's what I was really striving for, and, and doing that with the added burden of having to make things up without actually making anything up is why it took me 10 years to write the book. It, it, it involved a lot of hard thinking and a lot of revision. Yeah. I think you just kind of answered my question. <laughs> my question was, what was, what were you trying to achieve with the book? I mean, what was the point, what were you? What I'm sorry, could, could you speak up? Sorry, my, I think you may have answered my question already. I was about asking what your intent was with the book in terms of what you wanted readers to get out of it. Oh, what okay. What you were hoping that readers would... Uh, you know, that's a great question. I mean, why, why, did, why did I write it? I actually had no intention of writing this book. When I went to medical school in the middle of my life, I th told myself that I was not going to write anymore. I had to give it up. We tell each other, ourselves things like that sometimes. It was a token of seriousness. But I didn't write anything or think about writing anything, really, until about a week after I finished my residency, maybe two weeks, because I slept through the first two weeks. Um, and I, I had a little spare time and a desk and a keyboard, and these things just started happening. Um, and at some point in the process, you start asking yourself, what, what are you doing here? What are you hoping to achieve? Beyond the, the original impulse was simply to try to make sense of what had happened to me over the preceding seven years. Um, I think there's a lot of mythology about medicine in our culture. It's not well understood. We're profoundly interested in it. I mean, there have been soap operas on radio and in film and on television about medicine forever. I mean, it, more than Westerns, it dominates our, our cultural imagination. And the portrayals of it you see in popular culture are usually not very reliable. And yet sometimes when I want to scare the students and residents I work with, I remind them that, that their patients knowledge of the hospital is derived almost entirely from television. Um, and I was hoping to write something that maybe did a little better job of, of giving people some warning about what they were going to find when they went to the hospital, what things looked like from the other side. 
Um, I was hoping to, I was just hoping to get it down and get it right, because I think there's a lot of interest in it, and it's something that's really, really hard to get. It was hard for me to get, and I was there. So, trying to make sense of things, that's why we write. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned students, and uh, you teach at UNC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, the cost associated with medical school today, and uh, how would you uh, encourage somebody who's thinking about maybe going into medicine since you deal with students? Um, that is a really great question. It's one that's close to my heart because I do teach at the institution where I received my degree, and it's a very unusual institution in that we charge very little for the MD. When I was in medical school, I was paying about four times more for daycare than I was for tuition. And this really matters because when, when people graduate from medical school carrying a half million dollars in debt, it means they have to go into a specialty where they can do procedures all day and make a lot of money. They, they just have to, otherwise they'll have to declare bankruptcy. Um, you know, and I don't want to, I, I'm not crying poverty for doctors, I'm just talking about the way people decide what they're going to do with their lives. Um, if, you, if you're not burdened by debt, you can choose to do things where you're actually motivated more by, you know, the things that draw most people to medicine in the first place, like primary care, which is something we stress heavily in, in Chapel Hill. Um, I think the cost of medical education is just one piece of the profoundly broken excuse for a system that we have in this country. I mean, Obamacare is a great thing, God love it, but it's one tiny step towards fixing a horrendous mess, which can be fixed. They've done it in most of the other civilized countries in the world. But I think a system where people can become doctors without mortgaging their future would be a good one. Just like a system in which we, you can get sick without having to go bankrupt, or get demented and have to go in a nursing home without having to be impoverished. You know, it's, every time I'm in the hospital, I just came off of a rotation on the wards, I'm just, I, I'm just outraged all over again at what a callous nation we are in our treatment of the sick and the old. And not until the year when most of us get seriously ill in an election year are we going to hope, am I hoping I'm gonna see a change, but I don't know, I'm in Washington, maybe somebody's listening. <laughs> you have to be an optimist to be a geriatrician. Yeah. So a few questions ago, you mentioned um, communication, and I am a pre-med student, and I'm just curious about what you think about the analogous program that somebody recently won a Nobel Prize for that matches recent medical school graduates with a residency program. Being that, I'm not sure what your knowledge is about this, although I'm sure you, you know quite a lot about it being in the field. Um, the program is very inhumane in the fact that there are no humans making this matchmaking decision. It is simply an analogous formula in a computer that is matching medical school graduates with residencies across the nation. Um, I actually am not familiar with the version you're talking about, but residents and medical students have been matched by an algorithm for years and years and years. The, the data going into the algorithm are, you know, what the medical student wants to do and what the medical school wants to admit. So I don't think there's any attempt to understand the best fit between medical student and medical school. It strikes me as a horrible kind of hubris. I don't really think there's a... I don't think we have an algorithm that's good that way. Um, it seems to me a typical kind of overreaching, but bear in mind, this is an educational process in which you can't really, we, we, we are not able to define what we're trying to achieve. You ask somebody to tell you what a good doctor is, it's, you, you get, it's like art, which is why medicine is still ultimately an art. I mean, it's not something where you can get data to quantify your deliverables, even though that's, kind of the language we're forced to speak. Um, you know, a good doctor is a good human being who knows a few things. Thank you for reading, uh, thank you for reading your passage. Could you speak a little bit to if you're able to bring your artistic background into teaching medical students, and if so, how? Um, thank you, yeah, I, um, I get to teach writing workshops to medical students. I can't tell you how much fun that is and how rewarding it is. I, every, every year I do a, um, what's an elective for second year students in which 
the only assignment is you have to write something autobiographical in which you were on the medical side of the event rather than the patient or family or spectator side. And um, even though medical students aren't supposed to be able to write, they write powerfully and the rest of the students in the workshop have this unerring instinct for the point where the, the writer has elided something, fudged something, missed something, confused something. And what I think they get out of it is, um, I think if you write, try to write an honest story about something you did, you have an opportunity to get some insight into the real reasons why you do the things you do rather than the, the party line that we all absorb, you know, that we're doing this because we love mankind. There's often, a, that may be part of it, but there's often a lot of motives in the room and if, if you don't know what your motives are entering the room, you probably shouldn't go in. I think insight is the most important tool the doctor brings and writing is I think a really valuable means of acquiring it. Yeah. Hi, you are a gerontologist, I understand. A uh, geriatrician. A geriatrician. gerontologist okay. knows more than a geriatrician does, okay. but he doesn't Sorry. treat people. Okay, well, I'm reading the book Being Mortal right now. Oh, 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 I'm, and, getting, I'm uh, getting the hook. Uh, I'm afraid there's going to be the last uh, okay. question. Yeah, okay. Atul Gawande, wonderful book. Great, right. great, and great guy. The question is, people living longer and longer, and um, the way our society is set up, and they're living, I have a mother who's going to be 104. She's totally with it mentally, but she's well aware of her limitations. She says, why am I still alive? Uh. Now, the issue is, in the Gawandi's book, he talks about his grandfather, he's at the center of the big family, everyone's right there. Well, we're all spread out now. Yeah. I keep her, you know, in her house, but nevertheless, she's bored. How, what could we, how do we solve this problem? As I know it's not a medical problem per se, but... Well, no, actually, no, I, I deal with this a lot. I mean, we don't have a lot of resources for older people, and boredom is a huge problem. And, um, you know, there are senior centers in some communities where people can go and have more social interaction, but it used to be the family, and we don't have that anymore in the way that we used to. And I know the family isn't ideal, but it, it's... But it is family. And, Definitely. you know, older people who may be less mobile because their joints don't work anymore or things like that, you know, it, they desperately need some kind of contact and, and things to do. And I have no solution to this. I'm afraid it's going to mean spending money, but, you know. Well, that's it. I know that, but it is a problem. I think it's going to get bigger and bigger as people live longer and more healthily and then become more and more aware of what they can't do. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. I'm getting some really emphatic uh, suggestions to wrap up. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience. Thanks for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.